Hi, Merrill. I've been an aquatic ecologist with the Lakes and Ponds Management and Protection Program for over 20 years, and it's been my privilege to monitor the status and trends in Vermont's inland lakes for compliance with the Clean Water Act and the Vermont Water Quality Standards. Um, oh, another user has taken control. Sorry, not sure who that might have been, and I'm guessing it was probably not something intended, so uh, I'm going to take back that control. Sorry, everyone. Um, but today I'm uh, going to give you some background as to why natural shoreland erosion control is so important to our lakes to help put today's training into perspective for you. But first, let's start by defining what exactly a lake is. So lakes and ponds are depressions in the land where water collects, they are permanent, and they hold large amount of water year round. In the study of lakes, or the field called limnology, lakes and ponds differ from each other in terms of depth. The limnology textbook defines a pond as a water body where light penetrates to the bottom throughout the water body, and hence aquatic plants can grow everywhere. We call that area where the light penetrates the littoral zone. In contrast, a lake is a water body with an open water area where light does not penetrate to the bottom. This area tends to be cold and dark and plants don't grow here. And just uh, for folks who are just joining, if you can turn off your video and mute yourself, that would be great because um, that we have a lot of people on the call today and um, that uses up a fair amount of ba bandwidth and um, some of the presentation is kind of uh, large. So you may have uh, better time viewing it uh, uh, if you've got your cameras off. Thank you guys. Not that I don't wanna see you, but. Uh, so what we call lakes and ponds is whatever we like. So this is an example of a lake that's called a pond in Vermont. And this is an example of a pond that's called a lake. So I'm hoping that that now clarifies any confusion you've had over the years about what's the difference between lakes and ponds and why we call them what we do. Now lakes and ponds are the sinks or basins where the water from the watershed ends up. And many of the activities that humans do on the land and the watershed, despite being miles from the lake or pond, can result in delivering pollution to a lake. Hence, we have all kinds of regulations and voluntary activities geared toward protecting our lakes and ponds in the watershed miles from them. We have stormwater regulation that box stores like Lowe's have to comply with, that ski areas have to comply with, and wind farms have to meet. We have acceptable management practices that logging operations must meet, and we have required agricultural management practices that farms have to meet. Towns now need to bring their non-compliant hydrologically connected roads up to new standards through the municipal roads general permit. We have individuals picking up their pets waste and we even have individuals picking up other people's pets waste. We have homeowners putting rain barrels on their house to intercept the runoff from their roofs. We have parks putting in pervious pavement to infiltrate the water. Now, all of these people, municipalities, farms, and businesses are doing these practices to reduce the pollution they send to our lakes and ponds. So we can all, including, including the owners of lakeshore residences, enjoy our lakes now and into the future. But what happens on the lakeshore is important to a lake or pond as well. All of these development practices were legal in Vermont until 2014. This development happens in what is a critical habitat area of a lake. And in addition to the impact it has on the lakeshore habitat, it also impacts the littoral zone, which is considered the nursery ground of a lake. And again, the littoral zone is the area of a lake or pond where light penetrates to the bottom. So if you've ever been out on a large lake in a storm, you know the ferocity with which winds and waves can beat on the near shore environment. And as a terrestrial species, we see this world during a storm as a very dynamic and sometimes dangerous environment. Certainly the prospect of being bashed against a rocky shore is frightening if you're caught out in a boat during such a storm. 
However, if you happen to be in that water snorkeling or scuba diving at eight feet depth or more, as I have during some storms, not really bad ones, but the perspective is completely different from below the surface. So let's take a moment and dive below the surface to see just what this world is like here in Vermont. The submerged aquatic world of a lake doesn't really experience the rapid extreme changes in physical conditions that we in the terrestrial world experience. And that's part of what makes it a perfect nursery ground. In winter, nature builds a protective ceiling of ice that shelters the lake and pond life from the fierce winter storms and below freezing temperatures. So change in the littoral world is slow. Things are relatively static here compared to a river or even in the terrestrial world. And snorkeling through it, you can feel a sense of peace here that exists in the terrestrial world, but really isn't the norm. So I've snorkeled and measured habitat parameters uh, at over 650 different sites on more than 75 lakes and ponds in Vermont and Maine. I realized just how unchanging the littoral zone is when I had to return to a number of these sites and to survey them again five years later. And what was amazing was that the undeveloped sites, things hadn't changed. There was the same percent covers of woody structure and plants, and it was that experience which made me realize how static the physical environment of the littoral zone of our lakes and ponds can be. No wonder so much incredible life has evolved to use this part of our lakes. Food here is bountiful, whether you're a vegetarian, a carnivore, an omnivore, a phototroph, there is something for you to eat in the littoral zone of a lake. And it's for this reason that so many species lay their eggs here and make their nests here in the shallow near shore environment. And the diversity of structure available to pl from plants to woody structure to boulders and cobbles makes this a place of food and refuge for all kinds of biota. Just look at the complexity of the habitat, the diversity of the structure. There are all kinds of interstitial spaces between these rocks for macroinvertebrates, snails and fish to take refuge in and live. The diversity of life in the littoral zone really is quite amazing. Plants are aquatic life, but they're also habitat. And small fish find refuge and food in aquatic plant beds. And there are a diversity of plants in Vermont. And there's freshwater sponges, there's different fish species, there's more plant species, there's mussels, and there's more fish species. But the near shore environment is shaped largely by, by what the lake shore is like. So wetlands provide structure for eggs to be attached, refuge for fish avoiding predators, and abundant food that grows on and around the plants. The plants themselves alter the energy of the place by dampening the effects of waves, which causes particles to settle out here and continue to enrich the sediments, which supports the plant growth. In Vermont, there are two major types of lakeshore, wetland or forest. Forests form the majority of lakeshore habitat across the state, and Vermont's rich diversity of aquatic and terrestrial species have evolved to use the complex habitat structure that exists along these shores. As we, as we have seen, there is a diversity of structure and habitat off of forested shores, but there are some things our forested shores consistently provide that organisms in the lake have evolved to depend upon. The, lake, the forested lakeshore uh, provides shading, it provides leaf litter, it provides woody structure from small sticks to big fallen trees, and it provides a source of nutrient enrichment with water, phosphorus, and sediment running off at rates and concentrations that are natural. We think of phosphorus and sediment as pollutants, but a pollutant can be the excess of something that exists naturally. Contrast that forested site I just showed you with what a developed site devoid of trees and covered by lawn and impervious surfaces delivers to the littoral zone. Such a developed site delivers five times the runoff, seven times the phosphorus, and 18, 18 times the sediment to the littoral nursery. All that sediment runoff washes into the lake and buries the cobbles and interstitial spaces important to fish and macroinvertebrates. It buries the eggs laid in these nursery grounds and prohibits them from getting enough oxygen to survive. This is a rock that was pulled from a, the sediment off of a developed site. 
The top line represents how far it was embedded into the sediment, how much it had been buried. This rock looks like it was probably about 50% buried. And this is the desert-like habitat we create off our developed sites. By importing artificial sand and putting it on the shore, in addition to what is running off from the lawns and impervious surfaces located adjacent to the littoral nursery grounds. We remove aquatic plants and woody structure. We desire this type of habitat for our recreation, but we can't make the whole lake this way. It disrupts the ecological balance in the lake. Now, while the natural state of the near shore aquatic habitat of a lake is very stable, there is a force of nature that is dramatically altering it, humans. We are drawn to our lakes, and as such, we want to get as close to them as we can, and we bring our suburban values of neat and tidy lawns and power-washed houses with us. But there's a limited supply of lake area in the state. Lakes make up less than 4% of the Vermont landscape, and as of 2003, less than 5% of Vermont let residences are located within 100 feet of a lakeshore. As of 2003, 45% of lakeshores were developed, and they are densely developed. With the density of residences within just 100 feet of a lakeshore being twice that of our urban areas. I'd like to emphasize this point. So since 1970, Maine has not allowed residences to be built within 100 feet of their lakes. Meanwhile, our lakeshores have so many residences within 100 feet of our lakeshores that the density of residences around our lakes is greater than that in our urban centers. Now, lake ecosystems can withstand some level of poor development practices. A lake like Shadow Lake and Glover, for, for example, could be resilient to some of its lakeshore being poorly developed with a few camps. But 68% of Shadow Lake's natural shoreline is gone. As of 2003, 68% of Shadow Lake shoreline has been converted to lawn, buildings, patios, decks, and other impervious surfaces. If this all this impervious surface was one landowner, say Lowe's, that landowner would have had to reduce the runoff, phosphorus, and sediment coming off of its impervious surfaces and draining into the lake. But it's not one landowner. It's lots and lots of small landowners, and they don't have to get stormwater permits like Lowe's does. Results from the 2007 National Lake Assessment found that in Vermont, the largest proportion of lakes in poor condition was for physical habitat complexity, with 16% of the lakes in the state in poor condition for physical habitat complexity. Poor physical habitat complexity affects twice the percent of Vermont lakes that are affected by high levels of phosphorus and twice the amount of lakes that are affected by acidification from acid rain. Physical habitat complexity is a measure of the condition of the lakeshore and the shallow water habitat combined. That same study measured the presence of human activity on the lakeshore and in the nearshore area as lakeshore disturbance, which can be thought of as how intensively we use our lakeshores and the likelihood that evidence of human activities will be visibly present on or near the lakeshore. As of 2007, more than 80% of Vermont's lakes were determined to be in fair or poor condition for lakeshore disturbance, which is notably worse than both the nation and the Northern Appalachian ecoregion. And that's because many states had restricted development immediately on or near the lakeshore, but Vermont did not do that until 2014. In a study, another study, we determined uh, that, that we had done on 40 lakes in Vermont, that the unregulated development of Vermont's lakeshore has had a deleterious effect on aquatic habitat and biota, which is in conflict with, with Vermont's water quality standards and the Clean Water Act. We sampled 151 developed sites that had converted the forested shore to lawn and impervious surfaces and compared that to 240 34 reference undeveloped forested sites with similar exposure slopes that uh, near those developed sites. And we collected habitat and biological data at each of the sites. 
we snorkel transects parallel to the shore. And what we found was that across the board, for every habitat and biological parameter we measured, we found a statistically significant difference from the reference condition. When the magnitude of this change was compared to the magnitude of change that happened, say, to the real estate market and banking industry in 2008, remember that brought down the world economy, it turned out the change we were causing to the littoral environment was orders of magnitude greater. The magnitude of change this kind of development is having on the habitat and biota that live in the littoral zone is dramatic, and it is in conflict with Vermont's water quality standards. We also found that when aquatic plants are abundant, lakeshore owners go into the lake and remove the plants in front of their camps and residences. If you do this throughout a lake or pond, you can switch a lake from a clear water lake dominated by aquatic plants to a turbid and murky lake or pond dominated by algae. This is what happened to the pond in Prospect Park in Brooklyn, New York. When the nuisance plant community was removed, it switched to a pea soup pond. And without the plants, the sediments aren't anchored and the wave energy isn't dampened and the bottom is constantly being resuspended. Once you switched a pond or a lake to this more turbid water state, the amount of um, reductions in phosphorus and, and sediments that you need to reduce even grows larger than when it was dominated by plants. So lakeshore owners not only remove trees from the shore, but they remove coarse woody structure from within the lake as well in an attempt to clean up the lake. And we used to call this woody debris, but we realized that calling it debris was not really going, it had a connotation that was something to uh, be removed. Uh, in, um, I think it's in Oregon, they still have build board, ballot boards up, I think that say woody debris, woody debris, let it be, um, but we've gone to, on to using it, uh, the term coarse woody structure uh, to stop with that connotation. Um, but with no more trees along the shore, there's no more recruitment of new coarse woody structure into the lake. In Wisconsin, they studied what effect this was having on fish. And because Wisconsin has so many lakes, they can do whole lake experiments like this one. They took this lake that had two basins and put a curtain up between the two basins. They measured the abundance and growth rates of fish in both of the basins. And then they set out removing the large woody structure from the one basin. Then they went in and monitored the effect it had on the fish populations. And what they found was that the yellow perch population crashed in the treatment lake, the one with all the woody structure that had been removed, and they found that prior to the removal of the large woody structure, the bass in the treatment basin had higher growth rates than bass in the reference basin. But after the treatment of removing all the woody structure, what they found was the growth rate of bass declined and was less in the treatment basin, the one with all the woody structure removed, um, than in the re reference basin, with the younger, smaller bass seeing a real decline in their growth rates. The removal of woody structure also removes the, subst uh, the substrate that a whole community of organisms lives on. This community is made up of microscopic animals, plants, and bacteria that is an important food source for fish and macroinvertebrates. We found statistically significantly less of this community, what is called alfux, it's a German word, it's also a really good word to, to, to yell out when you're slipping on it uh, in the littoral zone. But what we did found in our study was that we had significantly less alfux off of the developed sites versus the undeveloped sites in our study of Vermont lakes. This study by Reed in 2001 showed that bass choose undeveloped sites to nest. Another study found fish nests on lakes with denser development were less likely to produce swim up fry. This study published in 1992 found that the diversity and abundance of fish decline with development. And another study found that the diversity of fish found off, de un off developed lakeshore was less than that off of undeveloped shores. A study from Wisconsin showed that green frog abundance declines with increased homes per mile. Two other studies found that dragonflies decrease with poor development practices. Now, dragonflies eat mosquitoes as adults and are food for fish when living in the lake. 
This study in Ontario found the winter browse supply for deer was four times lower on developed lakeshore lots than undeveloped lots. And this 1995 study found that the winter carrying capacity of white-tailed deer decline without that winter browse. I'll just go back to that last slide. Sometimes you see this on some lakes in Vermont, and uh, you know when you when I first saw it, I thought maybe it was an indicator of uh, water level fluctuation. But it's really from when the um, in the winter time uh, when the deer can walk on the ice and they can browse uh, along that. And you can see on some lakes, you can see this just really perfect, perfect line along the undeveloped shores. In central Ontario, they found that mink activity decreased as a function of the level of lakeshore development. Along buffered shores, mink activity varied depending on tree types, with shores that were dominated by deciduous trees not being used as much by mink. Um, but as the proportion of conifer trees along the lakeshore increased, so did mink activity. Obviously, the clearing of vegetation from developed lots was responsible for the decline in mink activity along developed shores, or at least they found. So I've told you how poor lakeshore development practices harm lakes and are in conflict with Vermont's water quality standards and the Clean Water Act. But is it even possible to develop a lakeshore and protect aquatic habitat, biota, and water quality? In 2011, Vermont DEC teamed up with scientists from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection to perform the same sampling we did in Vermont in Maine. And we sampled developed sites meeting Maine's mandatory shoreline zoning standards. We went to 36 buffer developed sites and 13 reference undeveloped sites on five lakes in Maine. The goal was to determine whether Maine standards are effective for protecting aquatic habitat. What we found was that across the board, all but one of the parameters measured were not statistically different from the reference undeveloped condition. The only exception was dragonflies, which they were still significantly less at the developed sites, but their abundance at those uh, developed sites was greater than what we had found even at our reference sites in Vermont, which suggests sort of a whole lake effect of uh, development might be going on. Regardless, what this study found was that it was possible to develop a lakeshore and protect aquatic habitat and biota. It just meant doing so in a manner that met Maine's mandatory shoreland zoning standards. So in 2013, Vermont launched the LakeWise program, which Allison's going to talk about a little later today, and modeled it after Maine's LakeSmart program. And in 2014, Vermont passed the Shoreland Protection Act, modeled after Maine standards, which Laura DeLugalecki is going to talk about uh, today as well. And these are two tools that Vermont has to address poor lakeshore development practices in Vermont. As of 2012, we were almost at the halfway mark in Vermont. We've got roughly 1,500 miles of lakeshore on all our lakes, 10 acres in size or greater. 45% of it has been developed as of 2012 with poor lakeshore development practices. How we develop the remaining 808 miles of undeveloped lakeshore and redevelop the already developed 672 miles of lakeshore will determine the future of Vermont's lakes. And that's why we have to change our lakeshore development practices and behavior in Vermont. And that's why we are counting on you folks to help us with that. And that is what this training today is in part to help with. So in closing, I'll leave you with some stark findings recently released to put this into a global context. According to the 2020 World Wildlife Fund Living Planet Report, Lakes, rivers, and wetlands are home for around one in 10 known animals, and freshwater diversity is declining far faster than that in our oceans or our forests. From 1970 to 2016, there has been an 84% decline in the average global freshwater population size. In Vermont, we can help bend this trend by protecting and restoring lakeshore and littoral habitat around our lakes and ponds. 
because this study of Northeast Lakes found shoreline, shoreline alteration is a higher indicator of biodiversity distress than eutrophication or acidification. And with that, I'll end. I do have some slides um, to show people how to look to see what the condition of the shoreline is on different lakes and ponds in the state if um, we have time for that, Allison. Um, you still have a little bit of time, but I will uh, open it up to questions first. If anybody has yeah. any questions they want to ask, you can uh, put them in the chat, raise your hand, or um, or Kelly can keep going on with their slides. Why don't you show us your slides and we'll see if any questions come up. Okay, sounds good. So um, I, I thought I'd share with you a way to see how well a lake, pond, or reservoir scores for shoreland and shallow water or littoral habitat. So just Google Vermont Lake Scorecard and pick the first thing that comes up, which is says Vermont Inland Lake Scorecard. And then you'll see a hyperlink um, that you can click on that says Vermont Lake Scorecard link, and which will bring you to this table of lakes and ponds. And then you can scroll through this um, to find the lake you're interested in. There's the first column has the lake name we call it. We have unique lake IDs for every lake and pond and reservoir in the state. But that might not be what you call it. So the next column over is some other common names that uh, that water body might be called uh, or often called. Um, and then you can go over, tab over to the column that says Lake Scorecard. And you can click on that for whatever lake I chose, Lake Willoughby. And that would bring you to the Lake Scorecard page here, or the, the report for the Lake Willoughby. And what you see in this is that um, there's, uh, this is shaped, the circle is shaped like a Secchi disc, which is a way of uh, measuring water clarity in the state. So it has four quadrants, and each quadrant um, scores the lake for a different type of condition. So we have water quality trend, shoreland condition, whether what the mercury, uh, atmospheric mercury pollutions like, um, and then we also have whether or not invasive species are known to be present or not in the lake. Uh, we also have a line around the watershed um, that either denotes whether or not it's um, least disturbed, moderately disturbed, or highly disturbed um, by uh, land use um, impacts. And then we also have uh, the lake itself can be colored whether or not um, it's listed as impaired uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, acidification could be one, um, nutrients could be another, um, and then you would see the lake color um, be blue if there were no, if it was currently meeting all of our water quality standards. What you see um, is for Lake Willoughby, the shoreland condition score, which is that measure of lakeshore disturbance, the how intensively the shoreline is used, that is uh, came from the EPA National Lake Assessment. That's in that top uh, right-hand quadrant of the, um, the circle there, uh, showing that um, Lake Willoughby is in fair condition. If you go all the way back to, if you're back in the Lake Scorecard uh, table, you can see that um, at the very far column, there's a next generation lake assessment reports. These are interactive reports. And uh, for this one, um, here is, I think I chose Harvey's Lake. Um, and you can see there's a little report card on the right that sort of tells you how the water quality is doing. And then it also tells you how the lake shore is doing. So in Harvey, Lake Har Harvey's uh, case, um, the lakeshore disturbance is poor. It's rated poor for its uh, lakeshore habitat. It's rated poor for shallow water uh, habitat. And it's also rated poor for um, physical habitat complexity. And that watershed is also um, pretty uh, disturbed. All right. Kelly, so, there was a question about how often these are um, updated, the numbers for these scorecards. Right. Very good question. So the numbers for the scorecard um, actually 
we're being uploaded uploaded annually um, and that was if we have a volunteer monitor on the lake so there's another page i didn't show you for the scorecard which actually you click on um, it says water quality trends and that um, at, that uses our volunteer um, lay monitors who volunteer on about 90 lakes in the state to sample a lake eight times and then I uh, and my colleague will try to get out um, to as many of the other lakes at least once every five years. Um, that doesn't always happen, but we try to get to at least the ones that seem to be changing um, uh, more often if we can. Um, and we were updating this annually, um, but my colleague, Dr. Leslie Matthews has just retired and she was the one that did that. Um, and we have not had, um, been able to hire her replacement yet. Um, so this probably won't be updated until next winter. So it's going to be pretty static for the time being. Uh, Kelly, we did have another question in here. Or are you are you done talking about the scorecard or? Yeah. OK, yeah. Um, we have another question uh, from Kelly Statner. Can you dive a little deeper on to the consequences of removing aquatic plants, even invasive and problem plants? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, invasive plants are if, can out compete a lot of native species. Um, some invasive plant plants more uh, better than others, and ideally, you want to catch those infestations as early as you possibly can. Um, so that you can try to get, and we have a couple of success stories in the state where there was early detection um, of the uh, invasion um, and a rapid response. Um, and so Shadow Lake and uh, Glover is one example. Um, actually, that one was right after a tropical storm, Irene, Leslie Matthews, who just retired, was leading a Vermont Invasive Patrollers workshop, I think it was in October. So it was kind of late for even the plants to be identifiable. And uh, she identified it as part of that survey. She went overboard in her clothes to verify it because it was too deep to get with the rake they had. Um, and then they deployed a, a, a very rapid response, hand pulling and bottom barriers, and um, we have not detected it sin, uh, since they eradicated it there. That's the ideal situation. Once these um, non-native invasive species become, uh, you know, get very well established um, and start to, they can start to outcompete the native species in some places. And then management becomes a much more complicated, um, you know, scenario. And it's, you know, waiting between, you know, doing, you know, trying to control the invasive um, while also trying to not uh, totally destroy all habitat in the lake too. So, um, but uh, if you can selectively get, uh, remove the invasive um, and provide uh, a way for the native species to uh, recover and move into the spaces that were vacated by the, the non-native plants, um, then you can ultimately, you know, that is uh, probably the best case scenario we can hope for. Obviously, the best and cheapest course of action is prevention. So having greeters at our um, at our access areas, educating people that are moving boats around, uh, the anglers that to be sure to make sure they're uh, they clean their vessels, drain their vessels, dry their vessels, bilges between um, uh, lakes is is really key. All right, um, Kelly Stadner, I hope that answered your question. Kelly is also offering to email other Kelly okay. about yeah, sure. more details. Um, yeah, all right, another, another question here. Um, is that 
veg line on shoreline of lakes all due to deer browsing. On Seymour's 1,700 acre lake has that all around the lake. It seems like it would take many deer to eat all that. I don't know the answer to that question, Timothy. <laughs> I think a lot of the deer browse on um, on Lake Seymour, it, it is deer browse. Uh, that's my understanding anyway of a lot of the cedar, at least anyway, that's been um, browsed like that. I can think of a, a couple locations that it's definitely deer browse. Oh, maybe not all, but a lot. <laughs> there is that one really um, undeveloped shoreline. I think our station is near that, that we yeah, sample. That's, yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about on like mm -hmm. the southern tip. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions from the group here about if I've, Kelly can answer for you. Um, if there are none, we will move along a little ahead of schedule. So last chance, everybody. All right. Um, well, with that, then thank you, Kelly, uh, for your great presentation. And if people have any um, follow up they are interested in or other questions they can think of, you can email Kelly those questions. Um, otherwise, next up, we have Laura Delugalecki, who is a permit specialist from Vermont DEC Lakes and Ponds. She's going to cover uh, the different kinds of regulations around permitting projects near Vermont's lakes and ponds. And then um, right after her, along with her today, we have Amanda Sales with the Army Corps of Engineers, who will be discussing the Army Corps regulations and permitting requirements around lakes. So um, take it away, Laura. And if you're talking, you're muted, Laura. Sorry about that. Okay, but we will try this again. When I entered the slideshow, I couldn't access my microphone and camera. Okay, there we go. All right, slide shows up. Yes, you're good. Okay, okay, wonderful. All right, well, um, my name is Laura DeLugalecki and I work in the Lakes and Ponds program with the regulatory group. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about regulations um, that you might encounter when working near a lake or pond. Um, and as Kelly kind of laid out, there's a, you know, a strong rationalization for why we need these protections near these sensitive ecosystems. And the Shoreline Protection Act is really built off of that. Um, in the Lakes and Ponds Program, we have three regulatory authorities, Lake Encroachment, the Shoreline Protection Act, and Aquatic Nuisance Control. We have this line that we call the mean water level, um, and that's our delineation between land and water. Um, so shoreland protection applies to the land between the mean water level and back across the landscape for 250 feet. Lake encroachment regulations apply to uh, activities at the mean water level and out into the lake. And then aquatic nuisance control is a regulatory program to, um, to permit aquatic nuisance um, control. It could be mechanical or physical barriers or chemical, but we're not talking about that today. It doesn't really have to do with development, but I just want people to know it exists. So I'm going to really focus on the Shoreline Protection Act and lake encroachment, and I'll briefly mention just a few other regulations that exist. Um, but um, the Shoreline Protection Act regulates the removal of vegetation and the creation of new impervious surfaces within that protected shoreland area um, on all lakes and ponds that are 10 acres in size or greater. So those are our public lakes and ponds. Um, and then we also have lake encroachment, and those are the activities that occur at the mean water level and out into the water. Um, usually that's like the placement of what we call fill, which could be riprap or stone to stabilize a shoreline, um, replacing an old seawall, replacing a culvert and adding riprap around the culvert, um, alteration of the lake bottom, like a dredging project. Those are all lake encroachments and would require a permit. I have this picture here of a road right next to the lake. Sometimes you might be doing a road um, 
stabilization project. It might require the removal of a tree and the installation of stone along the edge of the road near the water, and that would require a shoreland permit and a lake encroachment permit. So I'm going to dive into the Shoreland Protection Act quickly. And, um, you know, we've had high development pressure on our lake shores for decades. There's been a trend of converting small rustic camps to year round residences where people can retire, um, you know, where people kind of want to bring their suburban lifestyle to the lake. And that has a lot of um, impacts to water quality and fish and wildlife habitat and to erosion, as Kelly really went into. And so the purpose of the Shoreline Protection Act is to reverse that trend to allow for reasonable development that is and promote lake friendly development that reverses the trends of land loss and water quality decline and then also provides important habitat for fish and wildlife um really shifting from that suburban aesthetic to something that's more lake friendly so the Shoreline protection act regulates the creation of new cleared area and new impervious surfaces within 250 feet of the mean water level. Um, that 250 feet is measured horizontally through the landscape. And then the we call this area the protected shoreland area. And it's divided into two portions. The first 100 feet is the lakeside zone. And that's where our protections are a little bit stronger development is more restricted in that zone. And then the remaining 150 is the upland zone, and that's where we try to direct development activities. So the Shoreland Protection Act looks at basically four components when we look into a project in that protected shoreland area. We're looking at the total impervious surfaces on the parcel, and we're trying to minimize the impact of those. So impervious surfaces is basically anything that water can't run through. Um, the act does specify that it is um, human made. So, uh, it, you know, bare ledge doesn't count as an impervious surface, even though water doesn't flow through it. So, but it is anything with a roof, any kind of structure, garage, shed, home, um, concrete retaining walls, a lot of decks and patios are impervious surfaces. Um, and importantly, both paved and unpaved driveways and parking areas are considered impervious surfaces. Even, you know, a gravel parking area, over time it compacts and it behaves just like an impervious surface, unless it's specifically designed otherwise. We regulate um, the total amount of cleared area on a parcel. So um, cleared area is the opposite of vegetative cover. Vegetative cover has a mix of trees, shrubs, the natural ground cover, the duff layer, all those layers you would see in a natural forest that's spongy and allows water to infiltrate. Um, cleared areas is anything that's developed. So obviously an impervious surface, a developed area is cleared, but also grass lawn and landscaped areas are considered cleared areas because they don't provide any habitat, any kind of um, special ecological features that a naturally forested area would, and um, water easily runs off of grass lawn. So we, we try to minimize the total amount of cleared area on a parcel. We're also looking at the setback from the lake. We're trying to push things back as far as possible and at least 100 feet to maintain a natural buffer. And we're trying to de direct development off of steep slopes. So if development is proposed within the protected shoreland area, someone applies for a permit, these are the main standards that we're looking at. And this is kind of the ideal scenario. We call these the conforming standards. So any new development coming in, we want it set back at least 100 feet from the shoreline on a slope that's less than 20%. All the impervious surfaces that are there and are proposed, so the roof of the structure, the driveway, patios, decks, etc. All of that is less than 20% of the parcel and all the cleared area on there is less than 40%. So what that looks like in practice is something like this. Um, the first 100 feet is mostly forested. There's a nice little meandering pathway down to access the water and all the, the cleared area starts at about 100 feet. Um, there's minimal lawn space driveway, parking area, garage, is all that is set back further away from the lake. And then it's on a slope of less than 20% and those other percentages are met. 
So that's that's the kind of ideal situation. All new development has to conform to these standards. So any undeveloped lots, someone comes in and they want to develop a currently forested lot, it has to meet these standards. Sometimes this happens uh, a few times a year. Somebody has an old lot that was created long before the Shoreland Protection Act went into place. So the Shoreland Protection Act was enacted on July 1st, 2014. Sometimes people have these old lots in their families they've been holding on to for decades and they're undeveloped. Um, and it may only be 90 feet deep or less. Um, we can work with people on those lots. They've kind of been um, allowed to be developed in a reasonable way. Um, we work with the applicant to set the to any new development back as far as possible while also meeting local town zoning requirements that they have to be so many feet off the road or whatever. Um, but we work with them. We cannot authorize anything within the first 25 feet, so really tiny lots couldn't be developed. But then all these other standards need to be met. The slope, the impervious surface, and the cleared area all have to be met. But by far the most common scenario we see in Vermont are these existing lots that were developed long before the Shoreline Protection Act went into place. Um, these existing non-conforming lots were often developed you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, sometimes the structures are 20 feet from the water or they're right on the shoreline or they even extend out over the water. So the Shoreline Protection Act recognizes that a lot of these parcels exist and that redevelopment can occur on these lots. Um, the standard is if you wanted to add an addition or a garage or tear down and rebuild, um, you can maintain your existing footprint and you can expand away from the lake or to the side in some cases. We prefer away from the lake, but we do allow to the side as well, uh, depending on just case by case scenarios. But all the other standards need to be met. So the slope, the impervious surface, the cleared area, all those need to be met. And somebody could come in and they could put a small expansion to the side or away from the lake with a shoreland permit and meet all these standards. And then there is one other like kind of small exemption for the first 100 feet that was put into the um, the Shoreline Protection Act, and it allows every person to have um, a small 100 square foot something. It could be a deck or a patio or a shed um, closer to the water. It's called a shoreland registration. It's a different process than the permitting process, but it allows you to have something small closer to the water. Um, but it's a one time use, so you can't get multiple registrations on a parcel and it's it stays with the land record forever. So even if you move away and you did that registration, the new owners couldn't then do that as well. So um, on a lot of these older parcels that were already developed, the, the parcels are far exceed the the percentage standards for the total amount of impervious surface or cleared area. And if somebody comes in and wants to do some sort of expansion, we require them to offset any new impervious surface or any new cleared area in order to do that project. So we use a suite of best management practices, which Allison will be talking about more later. But for example, if somebody comes in for a small expansion and their parcel is already 20% over 20% impervious, um, they're going to have to offset any additional impervious surface on that parcel. And one way is through the installation of gravel drip line infiltration trenches. And these are really becoming quite standard practice in a lot of um, lakeshore development, um, but it, it captures roof runoff and it prevents it from running across the lawn and down into the lake um, and allows the water to slowly infiltrate into the soil um, and uh, it, it prevents erosion. And we work with applicants all the time on this. We have a calculator that says if you need to offset 300 square feet of impervious service, then you need X linear feet of gravel drip line infiltration trench that is 18 inches wide and 12 inches deep or whatever is appropriate for the site. So we work with applicants on that all the time. Or if somebody <clears throat> has a very steep driveway, that's far over the 20% slope standard and they need to do some reconfiguration to their driveway, we might require them to install water bars across that driveway and direct that water into a vegetated area to prevent erosion downslope. Um, if a parcel is already more than 40% cleared and somebody needs to remove a tree to do their 
project, then we're going to require revegetation at a minimum of a one for one level. And we often try to get the vegetation as close to the shoreline as possible. There are a lot of exemptions from the permitting process. <clears throat> um, you can read this list. I'm not going to read the whole list to you, but um, one thing I just want to mention, and I should have said this at the beginning, but one really important take home message I want you all to understand is that, you know, this is a complicated <laughs> set of regulations um, and nobody expects all of you out there working with shorelines to be experts. We are resources for you. Um, please call us, email us. Um, we can come out for site visits. We can review site plans. It's always better to ask first to see if something needs a permit rather than to go forward and, you know, find out later it did. So. Um, there are some exemptions that are pretty straightforward. One is any kind of maintenance of an existing footprint. So if you have an existing house and you want to tear it down and rebuild it in the exact same footprint, no shoreland permit would be required. We're not concerned with the height or the interior configuration. We're just considered concerned with that footprint. If you were to take a 1,000 square foot house, tear it down and move it to the side on a different footprint, then that's Consider the creation of new impervious surface and it would require a permit. So it's really where our review is triggered by a change to the footprint. Um, probably the most contentious thing is the removal of dead, diseased, and unsafe trees. Um, there's a lot of people out there who know the Shoreland Protection Act exists and they know that it protects vegetation. And when they see a tree coming down, they get upset and they call our office and we have to send out an enforcement officer. So this is another scenario where if you have dead, diseased or unsafe trees, you can remove them without a permit, but it's really a good idea to document that it's unsafe and to kind of give, give our office a heads up. A lot of folks um, call us first and we just say, take a picture, send it to us, talk to an arborist or a professional to get their opinion. Some trees lean and they lean for decades and they're fine. But if you have a dangerous tree right next to your house, absolutely, you can take it down. Um, the requirement is that the roots remain in the ground uh, and that you're not excavating out and causing a bunch of erosion all around that um, tree. So the roots remain in the ground, but you can remove unsafe or dead trees. Everybody can have a footpath to access the water. It can be no more than six feet wide, but it can be a staircase. It could be a meandering dirt path. It could be an ADA accessible um, path. There's lots of options and no specific requirements, except that you only have one and it's no more than six feet wide. Um, and then to get back to that footprint thing, maintaining existing lawns, mowing the lawn, um, changing out what you have in your garden, your landscaped area, none of that requires a permit. Repairing your driveway in the same footprint, that doesn't require a permit. Um, okay, and very quickly, I'm gonna talk about lake encroachment. Um, lake encroachment is a separate regulation that has actually been in place since 1968. A lot of people haven't been as aware of it, but I think with the passage of the Shoreline Protection Act and all the outreach about that, um, this regulation has gotten more attention. Um, so lake encroachment is anything that occurs at or beyond the mean water level. So a dock is a lake encroachment, dredging activities, boat ramp repair, um, old boathouse repair, water intake lines, all of these are encroachments. And what makes lake encroachment different than shoreline protection is shoreline protection applies to private land and lake encroachment applies to public waters. So these are waters of the state, therefore the public. You can kind of think of it as a state park. Um, so anything that you do out in the public water uh, it, it really can't be for private benefit. There are these old boat houses, old private boat ramps, um, but we don't allow those anymore. Um, they can be repaired if they exist with a lake encroachment permit, but um, we don't allow people to privatize public space. Um, a dock is probably the most common encroachment that you see. Uh, most private docks are exempt from permitting, provided that they're on posts or they're floating. Um, and as long as they're less than 500 sque square feet in area and less than 50 feet long, you don't need a permit for a dock. Uh, most buoys, floats, rafts, those are all exempt as well. Um, 
you do have that 500 square foot area that you have to use for your dock and your swim raft. Um, no solid fill concrete docks are allowed anymore, um, but there are some existing ones, especially on Lake Champlain, and, and people do have the ability to repair those, they just can't expand them. So when we get a lake encroachment application, we review a couple different factors. Because this is in public water, we want to make sure that um, that these projects are not excessive and that they have they're attached to a purpose. So for example, a shoreline stabilization project, you're requesting to put material out into public water, but there is a public benefit attached to that, and that is erosion control, water quality benefits. So if somebody were to ask like, to do a stabilization project that put a lot of material out in the water and kind of started to build land out into the water, we would say no, that is too excessive. There are less intrusive alternatives to stabilize the shoreline to get to that stabilization purpose. Um, and then we also look at impacts on water quality, fish and wildlife habitat. How does it impact navigation and recreation and other public uses? So we try to find the least intrusive approach to stabilizing the shoreline. Um, there's basically two types of shoreline stabilization that we authorize. There's structural and non-structural. And pretty much all of our new projects are non-structural. And we'll be talking about this more later. Non-structural um, uses natural materials like natural stone, vegetation and biodegradable materials to make slope designs that mimic what you see out in nature on a natural shoreline. Um, we have really moved away from using hardscaping to stabilize shorelines. Um, there's a lot of uh, undermining that can happen due to wave action on these vertical concrete walls. Um, over time, they get undermined, um, they fail a lot, and these non-structural methods can, if the vegetation and roots established there, they can be, they can last forever. They can be basically re-establish a natural shoreline. Um, so there are a lot of these old seawalls out there and people can repair them with a lake encroachment permit. Um, we're not requiring them to be removed, but we do work with a lot of people to change from structural solutions to non-structural and pretty much all new projects are non-structural, except for some very you know, tricky scenarios where maybe a house is built right on the shoreline and it's going to fall in and the structural solution is the only feasible engineering solution. Um, but mostly we just work with non-structural. Okay, very quickly, rapid fire. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you guys a little um, quiz that you can, since we're doing this virtually, you can kind of just answer in your head, think about this. Um, but remember, it's always best if you have a project idea, it's just it's great to ask first. We're happy to help. And that just because a lake and a lake and ponds permit is not required, that doesn't mean that other permits are, don't also apply. And so we can also help you help be a resource for that, direct you over to the Army Corps or wetlands program or whoever else might be around. <clears throat> so this was a stabilization project on Lake Champlain after the 2011 floods. All this was all just grass lawn down to the lake. The floods washed this area out um, and all the work occurred above the mean water level. So on land in an existing cleared area, they brought in fill, they brought in these biodegradable mats and they planted it with vegetation. Um, this did not need any permitting because uh, it was all no, there was no removal of natural vegetation, no creation of cleared area. There was no creation of impervious surface, so no shoreland permit. Um, and it was all above the mean water level, so no lake encroachment permit. Now, just because this project didn't need a permit didn't doesn't mean that they could avoid um, erosion control procedures. So they needed to have a turbidity curtain um, and to take proper precautions because discharging sediment into the lake is a violation of Vermont's water quality rules. Okay, so here's at Lake Iroquois at the Fish and Wildlife Access Area. This area was um, really trampled down and eroding. And so um, they use this machinery to 
install these fiber core rolls, which you'll be learning about later along the edge of the shoreline and to plant them to stabilize the area and re and to restore a natural shoreline. So yes, this needed a lake encroachment permit. Anytime heavy machinery goes into the water, that is the trigger of, for a lake encroachment permit. Um, these, this is at Lake Bombsine. This is the installation of encapsulated soil lifts along the shoreline. This road was really in bad shape, um, almost like a flat plain um, and even some undermining uh, along the road. And originally the landowners came together and they said, we want a seawall all along this road. And it was really great because our program worked with them and convinced them to try these encapsulated soil lifts. Um, they, these biodegradable bags filled with soil, stacked terraced up with a natural stone toe and then planted with lots of vegetation. So this activity needed a lake encroachment permit because it was placing material out into the water. This is on Lake Dunmore. You can see there's this seawall and there are trees growing through the seawall and off to the, the, the second picture off to the right shows lots of trees growing on top of the seawall. So this seawall is failing and the landowner wanted to replace it. And this was an activity that needed a lake encroachment and a shoreland protection permit because of that tree removal um, and because of the seawall touching the lake. So we worked with the landowner to get them both of those permits and we required a lot of replanting, but in a different location so that this same issue wouldn't come up again. Here's a culvert replacement. It required the placement of material out into the lake um, using heavy machinery. So yes, this needed a lake encroachment permit. Um, so for shoreland development, if you're rebuilding in the exact footprint without creating any new cleared area, so you don't need to remove any trees for construction access, no shoreland permit created, I mean required. <laughs> um, if you're constructing a new deck or patio, um, it's it could be either way. So we recognize that decks and patios can either be impervious surfaces or pervious, depending on how they're constructed. So if they're impervious surfaces, then you would come through the, the regular shoreland permitting process. If they're pervious, you still should talk to us because we have some guidelines on how to certify that a structure is pervious and you basically have an agreement with us that it's going to be managed as pervious. Um, if you are rebuilding a house and adding an addition to the existing footprint, then yes, that would need a shoreland permit because you're changing the footprint. If you're rebuilding the exact same square footage house, but in a slightly different location, yes, that requires a shoreland permit. Now, this is kind of my trick question. If you're rebuilding a boathouse in the exact same footprint, do you need a permit? Yes, you need a lake encroachment permit because again, lake encroachment is out there in public waters. It's a different review process than shoreland. So even if it's the exact same footprint, you're out there in public waters using heavy machinery, it needs a lake encroachment permit. A lot of the best management practice installations that you'll be talking about later today um, are of pervious design and they're installed in areas that are existing cleared areas. Usually they're eroding areas or they're replacing some kind of impervious surface, like installing these drip line infiltration trenches or a pervious paver driveway, infiltration steps. Typically those designs don't need a permit. Um, there's several types of vegetation management that don't need a permit, um, but it's always best to ask first um, you know, there's the six foot wide footpath exemption and the dead disease unsafe tree exemption. You can remove nuisance species. There's a little bit of thinning that can be done with the vegetation protection standards, which I didn't dive into, but if anybody's curious, I'm happy to talk to them about it later. Um, there, th these are, there are activities that you can do that don't require a permit, but again, it's really good to reach out and talk to us first. Anything beyond the exemptions is considered clear, creating cleared area and requires a shoreland permit. So there's a whole bunch of different regulations that might be occurring near lakes. Um, as of last summer, there's the half acre stormwater regulation. So, you know, a lot of lakefront parcels are pretty small, so you don't really hit this half acre of disturbance threshold, but it, it could happen. 
Um, you know, any kind of alteration of the number of bedrooms you have in a home might trigger a wastewater review. Um, so there's a there's a there are a bunch of regulations to be aware of. The wetlands program um, is a program that we work very closely with. They um, often, as Kelly mentioned, natural lake shores are often also wetlands. Um, wetlands are often associated with lakes. They have a protective 50 foot buffer around class two wetlands and any kind of project within that buffer would need a wetlands permit. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to try to understand if you might be in a wetland. Uh, we have a lot of resources on our website. Um, but you know, if you're if the ground is soggy, if you see cattails, if you hear frogs, there's a good chance that you could be in a wetland. And again, we can be a resource. You can ask us, we can direct you to the right people. We also have the Vermont Natural Resources Atlas. Um, it's a really useful tool to locate wetlands and the protected shoreland area. Um, you can turn, you can zoom to a location and turn on different layers and see where mapped wetlands are. You can also see where the protected shoreland area is. You can zoom in and, and see how much of your parcels in the protected shoreland area. Um, again, wastewater permitting is something to be aware of for any new construction. And um, I think, oh, okay, my final slide is, um, you know, probably one of the most common questions I get is, well, what happens if I don't get a permit or what happens if I don't follow my permit exactly? So we have an environmental enforcement office. Um, if we hear about a complaint, we inform the environmental enforcement officers and they visit and follow up on every complaint. Um, and then they communicate with us. Sometimes we get complaints and it turns out it's nothing. Uh, somebody just had an excavator parked in their driveway. <laughs> um, or we get a complaint and it's very concerning. And the environmental enforcement officer will talk to us. And our number one goal in the Lakes and Ponds program is to return the parcel into compliance with the regulations. So if somebody did something that they weren't supposed to do, we work with them to get them back into compliance. That's the most our directive. So that could be they remove some trees they weren't supposed to. We make them do some revegetation, some restoration. Or they did a project that was something that could have completely gotten a permit, but they just didn't apply. We work with them on after the fact permitting. Sometimes it's a combination of it. They might have to remove their project, put it somewhere else, and do some restoration and get some after the fact permitting. So there's a whole suite of options, but our goal is to get people back into compliance because we don't want people to just pay to keep it. So first it's compliance, then after it that moves back over into the hands of enforcement. And depending on the scenario, you know, sometimes people make an honest mistake. They were very, they quickly voluntarily complied. Sometimes those cases are just closed. Sometimes um, a ticket or a penalty is given, and sometimes things are elevated further, especially if multiple rules were violated, it goes into the environmental court system. Okay, and then here's our regions across the state. Um, we have two Lauras and Misha, and we cover the state, and we encourage you all to reach out to us. We work often with private landowners and contractors, realtors, municipal downtown folks, um, we're happy to help. And that is the end of my slideshow. Awesome, thank you, Laura. Uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat for you, so I'll uh, I'll just read those off. And if people have more questions, put them in the chat. You can also raise your hand if you wanna speak on the call. Um, so the first question here, if the lot is already more than 40% cleared, are BMPs required for redevelopment on an existing footprint? OK, so if the lot is already 40 percent cleared. Um, the in if OK, and if somebody comes in, I'm sorry, is it for somebody comes in with a new project or is it just like it sounds like it's a rebuild on an existing footprint? OK. So are if say, for example, and this is something that happens a lot, say, for example, a lot is almost all the way cleared. They have two trees on the lot and they come in and they want to do a small project to add a shed or something, um, we are not gonna require them to revegetate on the, uh, the trees unless they propose to take down trees. Basically, the way I explain it to a lot of people, it's like the Shoreland Protection Act took a snapshot in time 
from when it was passed from 2014. And new parcels have to conform to this higher standard. Old parcels can kind of stay how they are and they just can't get any worse. So if they propose to take down a tree, they have to plant what will decide what's equivalent. Like if it's a mature tree, it might be three saplings or four saplings, something that will grow up or if, um, you know, something equivalent, but they're not replanting all the way back up to the standard of only 40% cleared area. And that's just the way the rule was written. We certainly encourage folks to voluntarily do more, but the standards of the law just it's only if they propose to remove vegetation that they have to do additional revegetation. OK, great. Uh, next question. Can replacement vegetation be shorter? For example, replacing a white pine with half a dozen dogwoods? Yeah, it depends. Um, our requirement for revegetation is that it be unmaintained. So you can select for species that will be lower growing. But we're generally looking for the, the, what the law says is functionally equivalent. So um, often when, when there's tree removal, we are looking for tree replacement. Now it doesn't have to be in the exact same place. So you can be strategic, but there's kind of, you know, two different ways that vegetation removal happens. There's individual trees surrounded by grass lawn. Um, but then there's also just like, if you imagine like if you need to remove 500 square feet of vegetative cover, you're disturbing this whole area that was just forested that had a mix of all different types of stuff. So if you are removing a big chunk of vegetative cover, you need to revegetate it and you can use a mix of different species. You can plant shrubs. Um, we do try to require people to plant native plants that do well and um, yeah, and, and people do try to manage their views with, you know, certain species. I guess okay. it depends sometimes, too, about the site. For sure. It always depends, right? <laughs> um, depends. All right. Next up, many of these techniques would be useful for river health, too. Will development on rivers someday require similar permits? <clears throat> yeah, um, it would be great. We don't have a statewide river buffer regulation. Um, when the Shoreline Protection Act passed, I think originally they were trying to have sections of the Connecticut River, but right now there's not. There are some towns that have stream buffer rules, and I know it's something that has come up in the legislature frequently year to year in Vermont, but as of now, there's no statewide um, river buffer rule. All right, uh, next question. What's the cost associated with permitting? Um, so. Uh, for shoreland protection, it's there's like a $125 base fee and then a 50 cents per square foot of new impervious surface. Um, there's no fee currently for new cleared area. And then lake, lake encroachment, um, it depends on the project. Shoreline stabilization projects are around $200. Um, and then the other category of dredging or large marinas, those are on a different scale. There's like a, it's like a 1% project cost plus $300. All right, uh, do you need a permit if the existing footprint didn't have a foundation and you added one? And I'm assuming this is all in the same, in the same footprint. Right, yeah, so we look at um, impervious surface footprints from the overhead view from the roof line. So it doesn't matter if there's a foundation or not. Um, a really common project is people take these old camps that don't have foundations and put a foundation on them. If you're working within that footprint of the roof line, no shoreland permit would be needed. There might be like local town zoning permits required, but no shoreland permit. Okay, so this is a, a situation, a description of a situation. Okay. It sounds like someone is tearing down an old camp sited 45 feet from the shoreline. They wanna rebuild on the same footprint, a year round house but the owner has connected to the old septic system. How could this be okay? Doesn't the Wastewater Act require a specific a septic permit in this situation? If not, shouldn't Shoreland um, include that requirement? Yeah, uh, so there's a, one of the exemptions written into Shoreland is basically anything that the wastewater program authorizes is, is okay. 
um, they have the authority over that because we're, we're not really the experts on that. Um, I, I couldn't really speak exactly to that scenario, um, but I think whenever there is that kind of situation where you're um, tying into an old system that it, I, I, I'm fairly certain that the wastewater program reviews it. But right. yeah, that, that would definitely be a wastewater program question. Uh, agreed. All right. Um, are private docks allowed off of public beaches on lakes without needing an encroachment permit? Yeah, as long as, um, well, it depends. So when you say off of a public beach, um, you know, the public beach is maybe some but private property. Um, so if the dock were completely, this is the, so if the dock is completely out in public water um, and you have, you're not trespassing across somebody's private property, there's no, there's no qualifier that you have to own property to have a dock. So as long as your dock meets those exemption requirements I talked about, it's less than 500 square feet, not fit more than 50 feet long, it's supported on posts or floating, Technically, anybody could put a dock completely in public water. Um, but if most people, most docks touch the land and, um, you know, you need, would need to have permission from the landowner. Uh, all right. Are most enforcement actions triggered by citizens' uh, complaints? Um, I would say it's maybe half and half. Um, some of them. A lot are, I would say a lot by lakes are considered, are triggered by citizen complaints because um, the properties are very visible from people who are on lakes that, you know, things that you can't see from the road, but you can see from a lake. So we get a lot of citizen complaints that way. Um, they're also generated internally from our agency and DEC staff. When we're out and we see something, we lodge a complaint. Um, or if we're reviewing a permit and realize that somebody didn't do something the way they said they would, um, then that's like a non-compliance issue. Okay. Um, can one remove a tree with the management practice of having it grow back with many stems resprouting? Um, you know, just the act of removing a tree, uh, it, it could that it might need a permit or it might be exempt kind of depending on the scenario um so, so a lot of people want to know well can i i want to just plant a different tree here can i just remove this one and replant it but the regulation states that that creation of cleared area is jurisdictional so it might need some kind of authorization unless it's an exemption um even if you want to just remove it and allow something else to sprout there or allow plant something else, that creation of cleared area is the jurisdictional trigger for some kind of authorization. All right. Um, if there is an old 24 by 24 foundation with just a crawl space and you want to use that same footprint, but want a full eight foot foundation, does that need a permit? This is maybe the same as the other question. Yeah, it sounds like what you're describing is like, um, you know, if it's within the footprint of what's already there, then that's fine. You can maintain the footprint and, and it, we don't care if there is a foundation or not a foundation. It's really that footprint, the overhead view footprint. You can maintain it. If you're changing that footprint, then it would probably need a permit. And if you're not expanding towards the lake, it's something that we could authorize. And just um, to kind of say out just to put out there, you know, I think some people are put off by the idea that they need a permit, but if it meets the standards, generally a permit is issued. So, uh, Great. Um, does the act apply to private lakes and ponds greater than 10 acres? No, no, it's only public. OK. Um, with the recent and future electrification of boats and other aquatic vehicles, how is the Shoreland Protection Act providing regulation and guidance for powered docks? Yeah, that's kind of outside of the Shoreland Protection really only regulates development on the shoreland. Um, and then lake encroachment docks, we don't have a lot of guidance um, in that, you know, it's really just you can have a private dock as long as it's 
of this specific size. There's nothing in the language about um, electric docks. I'm not really that familiar with that. All right. Well, those were a lot of good questions for Laura. Yeah, thanks. Um, and if there are no other questions, we will move on to Amanda's presentation about the Army Corps of Engineers regulations and permitting. OK, I'm just going to share my screen. OK, um, are you guys able to see the screen? Yes. PowerPoint. OK, great. So I'm Amanda Sales and I work with the or I work for the Army Corps of Engineers and I'm going to give you kind of a snapshot of what our jurisdiction is. Um, it expands more than just lakes and ponds, but I'm going to focus on the lakes and ponds aspect of it. And so overall, this is kind of an overview of what my PowerPoint is going to be talking about. So the program goals and our regulatory authorities, um, what those are. And first off, I'll be talking about Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act and then Section 404 of the Clean Water Act and the applicable exemptions that I thought would be best to talk about today. And then our jurisdiction and what the jurisdictional waters are and what some of those exclusions are. And then go into the permitting process, the forms, and then the, the permit conditions that we look at. So first off, our program goals and regulatory authorities. So right off the bat, um, this is something I like to bring up to everyone. Um, this is what the Corps of Engineers across the nation stands for um, within the regulatory program, and that's to provide strong protection of the nation's aquatic environment, including wetlands, while allowing reasonable and necessary development to proceed, and then provide balanced decisions that are timely, predictable, transparent, consistent, and rooted in sound science and compliant with applicable laws. So to get started, um, first off, um, to talk about Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. So this is applicable to only Section 10 waters. And what I mean by that, I'll give you a list of what those waters are, but some of the bigger waters in, in our state. So Lake Champlain, I have some of them highlighted here on the screen in red, like the Winooski River, the Lamoille River, Lake Memphremagog, those types of rivers, um, rivers and waterways. Um, we regulate here any structures in these water bodies. So we would regulate a dock because it's in that water body. We would regulate an aerial transmission line because it's over that water body and then anything under. So if you start boring and putting pipes or pipelines underneath things, um, we've had a big um, utilities going under Lake Champlain. That's something that we regulate. So completely different act, the Clean Water Act. So separate from section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act, um, we have Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, and that's the discharge of dredged or fill materials into waters. And this is more expansive. So we're not just looking at those bigger water bodies like Lake Champlain, the Lamoille River. I can give a list of what the, all those waters are. But this also looks at wetlands. This also looks at um, uh, all rivers that we have here in the state, all lakes that we have here in the state. And I'll go into more specifically on how we determine waters. But just to start off what dredged or fill material is, that's, um, I have an example up here of a coffer dam. That's a temporary measure. Um, that's something that we would regulate. Bank stabilization, you can see in the, the lower right-hand corner that any hard riprap or stone material that we're placing below the ordinary high water mark, and I'll let you know on how we determine that, um, that's something that we would be regulating. Um, things that we don't regulate that's different than the state program. Um, and everything that I'm talking about is just Army Corps. It doesn't relate to the state program, but we work hand in hand on a lot of projects. So cutting trees. So if we're near a lake, that's not something that we're going to be regulating. Even in a wetland um, that's a regulated water body, cutting that um, actual vegetation is not something that we regulate. However, stumping that and doing mechanized land clearing and pushing and pulling that material, that's something that we're gonna be regulating. Solar, that's something that's coming up a lot here um, in the state a little bit. If you pound in piles into the ground, into a wetland or near a water body, that's not something we're going to be regulating. Maybe we have some hikers here today. Um, if you see these bog bridges throughout, that's something that we wouldn't be regulating. You're putting a, a structure over a wetland. That's not something we regulate underneath the Clean Water Act. Structures are only in Section 10 waters that we'd be regulating. So. 
have exemptions is plural. There's numerous exemptions, but a lot of our exemptions are applicable to a lot of agricultural um, processes. And so I just wanted to touch upon one exemption that we have that I think a lot of you, um, it may fall a lot of towns, this falls for a lot of towns and maybe a private landowner. If, um, for example, this picture shows a river that has a culvert that was blown out, if they wanted to take the culvert a new culvert and set it back in and have the exact same fill footprint, this is something that would be exempt. We wouldn't need a permit at all. You wouldn't, you could call the Corps and we could talk about it, but it's not something you have to report about as long as you're placing all the fills in the same exact footprint. Um, yeah, so this mainly happens after big storm events that we get calls about this. So you wouldn't be needing any type of permit. So our jurisdiction, um, this is something that hasn't changed right here. You can see the limits of the ordinary high water mark. This is something that we've got more defined and refined on how we explain ordinary high water mark. But this is something that hasn't changed on how we are looking at ordinary high water mark. And this is important um, for section 10 waterways um, explicitly, but also in our non-section 10 waterways. Um, so when we're regulating the discharge of fill material. Um, this is similar in the in the words of how the state calls it the mean um, high water, but we're looking at the ordinary high water mark. We're just being a little different on it. And you can see how in this picture on the right hand side, you see some shelving, some change in vegetation. Those are signs of how we would distinguish our ordinary high water mark. But in like Laura said, some of our bigger water bodies like Lake Champlain, we have a set elevation. So Army Corps, anything below 98 elevation, that's our already ordinary high water mark, and we'd be looking at any discharge of um, dredged or fill material below that ordinary high water mark. On the left hand side, I have a picture of kind of showing our expansion of the two um, the two acts that we have. So section 10, you can see how it's more restrictive. We're only looking below the ordinary high water mark. So those are structures. And then um, section 404, we're expanding our jurisdiction and we're looking at wetlands, we're looking at rivers, we're looking at um, smaller um, possibly waterways than the section 10. So this rule, so right now we are under the 2023 rule, um, and this is something that has changed back and forth. And when I say this, I mean our jurisdiction, so how we define a water and if we're going to be regulating the discharge of dredged or fill material. This does not relate to Section 10. This only relates to Section 404. Um, so any discharge of dredged or fill materials, we're looking at, okay, is this a water that we're going to regulate? And this is how we break them down into each category. So, this is the first one, traditional navigable waters. So if it's if you're placing dredged or fill material in one of these waters, it's definitely jurisdictional. And this is also a list of the Section 10 waterways that we have here in Vermont. And then impoundments. So the Waterbury Reservoir is one that comes to mind first for me. If you are impounding and you're, uh, there's a dam near you, that's something that'd still be jurisdictional to us. So discharging any dredged or fill material into an impoundment would be jurisdictional. Tributaries, so perennial, um, intermittent, sometimes ephemeral, those are all things that um, are jurisdictional. Definitely intermittent and perennial would be. However, ephemeral is sometimes questionable for people. And that's something that you would wanna come to the core if you were gonna be placing fill within ephemeral streams. Wetlands, um, this definition of how to uh, see if a wetland is a wetland or not has not changed since the um, 87 manual, um, but we've also gotten updates um, in 2012 of how we characterize wetlands here in New England. And then these are our exclusions. Um, so you may be in a water, so you may be in a ditch, but um, dependent on if it's an excluded waterway is um, kind of these lists right here. And I won't go through all of them. I just wanted to bring it up like wastewater treatment plants. Those aren't things that we regulate. So the take home message on this slide I wanted to bring up is that there's things called approved jurisdictional determinations. And what that means is if you're questioning if you're in a water or you're in a water body, so you're in a wetland, maybe you're in an ephemeral stream, and you're questioning, is it jurisdictional to the core? Give us a call and we can come out and we have to do something called approved jurisdictional determination, which means we come on site, 
we look at it and we document what's there. And then we pro uh, look at the applicable laws that are there and see if it's going to be jurisdictional or not. You can't just say, nope, it's not a water. If it has an ordinary high water mark or if it is a wetland, then that's something that we would be looking at if you're going to be um, putting dredged or fill material into. So our permitting process. Um, this is something that here in Vermont, we have 21 activity-based general permits. And what that means is it makes it so it's in a more abbreviated process for the applicant, or hopefully that's how the applicant views it, is that in, in each general permit, so each activity, so let's say bank stabilization, you're doing bank stabilization project, you may be in the self-verification portion of it, which means you don't even notify the Corps of Engineers, or you're in a pre-construction notification, and that's something that you would notify the Corps. And so each activity, and I'll show you kind of how that looks, each activity has these thresholds. So if you're on a bank stabilization project and you're over 200 linear feet, then that's something that you're going to need to be in the pre-construction. You're going to have to notify the Corps of Engineers. If you're below 200 linear feet, then you possibly, and I'm saying possibly because I'm going to emphasize what that means later, you're possibly able to fall into that self-verification, no need to contact us at all. Um, and then if you're in other um, water bodies like wetlands, we have thresholds of 5,000 square feet, and that's how you make the distinction between SV and PCN. And our application itself, someone brought up fees. The application itself does not have fees associated with it, but we do have fees to offset wetland and waterway impacts, and I'll go into that in a minute. Um, also, then there's an individual permit, which are for much larger projects. Typically, I say typically, a private landowner does not get into an individual um, permit. Um, and this is just anything that's over a minimal impact or anything that has um, more than an acre of uh, wetland or waterway impacts. I just wanted to flash that this is our pre-construction notification. What I um, mentioned briefly before on the last slide, this is the application that you would have to fill out and submit to us. And two slides ago, I talked about how we have 21 activity-based general permits, and this is the shoreline um, and bank stabilization general permit. So each page of our general permit has these boxes, and you can see how you would fit into possibly self-verification or pre-construction notification and see which elements you would meet. You can see like on the bank stabilization, if you're working in Lake Champlain, Lake Memphis, at Magog, or Wallace Pond or any of their adjacent wetlands, if you're placing fill in those waterways, you would have to you automatically get kicked into the pre-construction notification. However, if you're on different water bodies um, and you're below 200 linear feet and you meet all the general conditions of the permit, which I'm gonna go over, um, you'd be able to stay in that non-reporting. You wouldn't even let us know. Of course, you could always call us and we could talk through that process though. So, I kept saying how you could maybe be self-verification. This is one of the general conditions that we have in our general permit um, that talks about if you could stay within um, SV versus PCN. If you're in an area um, that could be um, sensitive to, you'd need to, sorry. If you um, were in an area that was sensitive for archeology span or you were maybe replacing something like an old historic um, bridge or culvert. This is when we would need to notify um, the the tribal people in this area and then the state historic preservation officer. So as long as you stayed and you notified those people, you could stay within self-verification versus going to PCM. Another one general condition is we have is we need to apply with Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act. So I flash up um, a couple of our endangered species or threatened species here in Vermont. We have the Indiana bat, northern long-eared bat, um, northeastern bulrush, dwarf wood mussel, the Canadian lynx, and then there's a candidate species, the monarch butterfly. But we have to make sure that we're complying. If you're cutting trees for some, if you're cutting trees with your project, you may not be able to stay within that SV category. Another general condition, if you're working within streams, this is something that kicks a lot of people from that SV into our PCN is you need to make sure you're working between July 1st and October 1st and you're embedding culverts. Um, this is the one that I like to emphasize the most on to anyone that I'm giving a presentation to or a general phone conversation with is that 
if you can avoid the impact altogether, that's what we have to look at first. Um, if you can minimize that impact, so like Laura had been talking about a lot, is if can we actually do the the footprint within the exact same um, footprint that's already existing? That's what we would want to be doing. And then if we are over those thresholds that I was talking about, the 200 linear feet or 5,000 square feet, we'd have to mitigate. And this is where someone asked about if there's any fees associated with permits. This is where fees come into play with the Army Corps of Engineers. If you have to mitigate for your project, so you're over 5,000 square feet um, or you're over 200 linear feet for a bank stabilization, this is where um, possibly the applicant would have to pay into this in lieu fee um, process. And it's approximately $4.59 a square foot. So if you, the things that you're going to be learning further today, like the bioengineering, those are good tactics, even if you are over 200 linear feet, those are good tactics to make it so possibly we don't have to do in lieu fee and we could proceed differently. Still, it'd be a conversation with the core of how maybe instead of doing a hard riprap project, but we're doing a, a bioengineering, something that's going to be sustainable for the environment in that area um, and not adding to any pollutants like the phosphorus that you guys will also be talking about later today. Um, maybe we could stay away from that in lieu fee. So with that said, I have our my contacts up on the, the screen and if anyone has any questions and I can go back to this one too. Uh, there was a couple of questions. Um, yeah. So we have one, um, any section 10 specified waters in Wyndham County in the Southeast of Vermont, but they may have answered their own question because then it says it looks like none. So. Can you confirm that? Yeah, um, in Wyndham, so like not Wyndham County, just overall. Uh, it's, in, it says Wyndham County, Southeast uh, Vermont. So we have the Connecticut. Um, yeah. It's like, yeah, in Northeast Vermont, we have like the Connecticut River and that's one that you would have, but I don't know how far over they are. Yeah, I think that they probably border on the Connecticut, but uh. So that's a good map to have up there. Um, next question is, what is the ballpark turnaround time on a request for verification? And I might have to ask that I'm guessing the verification on like our permits nationwide, we say 60 days. So if you put in a pre-construction notification, um, you'd be able to get that um, verification or permit decision within 60 days. Sometimes it can be less than that, though. All right. Those uh, those were the only two questions in the chat, unless anybody else has any questions they'd like to ask Amanda. Uh, going once. <laughs> um, all right, if there are no other questions about um, permitting, either for Laura or for uh, Amanda, oh, uh, Jennifer requests for you to please put up the address again. And when will slides be, will the slides be available? Yes, the slides will be available on the NSECC website uh, after this training, honestly, probably sometime in February, along with a recording of uh, the presentations. So, all right, um, if there are, oh, and someone else is saying it would be great to see where both jurisdictions interact, intersect, not interact. Um, which I guess is more of a comment than a question. So um, if there are no other questions, we're gonna take a quick um, 15 minute break and uh, we will reconvene here to learn about bioengineering case studies throughout Vermont. Um, so if everyone could take a break and be back here, let's say at 11, it's really more of like a 19 minute break. Um, that would be great. All right. Thank you.